and before the harvest. They were like the joy of finding such an unexpected refreshment in a dry land. No doubt Hosea pointed to the same in the early days of his marriage to Gomer and the delight she had brought him before her unfaithfulness. You know that happens in any relationship, especially in a marriage relationship. God was saying to these people, remember the past days when there was delight and refreshment in our relationships? Remember when all seemed so hopeful and hope-filled? Tender and wonderful to be guarded. That is what you meant to me. But all of that faded away. And those days are gone because of your unfaithfulness. God says, I tenderly took care of them in this way, but they went after other gods. That's why in verse 10, second part says, But they came to Baal Peor and consecrated themselves to the thing of shame and became detestable like the thing they love. They separated themselves from their covenant relationship with God. And to them whom they turned to, to the gods that they worship, soon they became the thing that they love. In Psalm 115, God had warned that those, that that which you worship, you become like them. Psalm 115, verses 4 to 8 says there, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. And look this in verse 8. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Don't we all embrace too readily the gods of this world and the ways of this world? Do we ever think of the consequences that God would someday judge us to? There are a considerable number of people that I know who have started out well with God. They crossed the river Jordan in a land of promise, as we may say. But somewhere along the path, they started to embrace the gods of this age and the practices of this age. Brethren, these people still come and they still worship on a Sunday every now and then. And some of them still talk of the ways of God. But their hearts and their lives are the ways of this world and of the gods of this age. I have seen and heard people talk of their sorrow for their sin and how they promise that things would change. But as you listen to them, you know that there is no real brokenness or turning from the past, just like Gomer, just like the Israelites. They have become like their gods, their idols, the things that they last for after. And as the psalmist says, says, their hands no longer feel, their feet no longer walk in the way of the Lord. Another description is in verses 7 to 8, second part of 7. The prophet is a fool. The man of the spirit is mad because of your great iniquity and great hatred. The prophet is the watchman of Ephraim with my God, yet a fowler's snare is on his, in all his ways and hatred in the house of his God. God also brings out the sins of those who are meant to be the proclaimers of the truth the prophets or the preachers. There is some debate as to the meaning of these verses. Some say that it is the response of Israel towards the spiritual men like Hosea. Israel again has so fallen from the truth that they would call true prophets fools and spiritual men insane people. Men who took their Bibles seriously would be reviled. And that is certainly true, as we have seen in the lives of the other true prophets and even in the life of Jesus Christ when he was here on earth. 
But I believe the context argues here that what God is talking about are the false prophets and those that are pretending to be spiritual. In Hosea chapter 9 verse 8, the verse 8 that we just read, the prophet is the watchman of Ephraim with my God, yet a fowler's snare is on all his ways and hatred in the house of his God. Hosea tells us here exactly who the prophet of Hosea verse 7 is. He is the false prophet, the one who is a fowler's near to the people who are gulled into believing his senseless lies. The prophets who ought to be acting as people's watchmen against disaster have actually become agents of the disaster themselves. Those who are supposedly the watchmen of Ephraim are really like bird scraps and what does the fowler or a bird hunter put into his snare what does he put into the trap to catch a bird it is something that the bird wants he puts something in that will take the bird's mind away from danger so that the bird falls and is caught into the trap he will not put something that will scare the bird away. Hindi naman siguro siya maglalagay ng isang pusa doon para matakot ang isang ibon. So that, but something that will attract it. But something na magpapa-attract sa ibon na yun. He will put the seed in there, make it look and smell very nice, and the birds will go in there and then be utterly destroyed. I believe that God is talking here of the Trump and sin in the religious circle, which is the proliferation of false prophets. This is similar to those we have seen in the prophecy of Jeremiah. False prophets who began to tell everybody that all is well. In Jeremiah 23, chapter 23, verse 16 to 17, ito po sinabi ni Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. Jeremiah warns, these prophets say no evil shall come upon you. Speaking from their own minds, they are telling you not to worry that God is not so holy after all. God is not so intolerant as some preachers have made him out to be. You can just imagine their sermon saying that God just wants you to be sincere. Yun lang mang kailangan ng Diyos. Just want you to be sincere in your, in your religion. God just wants you to be happy. And if going down to Dan or Beersheba, yun yung mga tinayo nila na templo sa Northern Kingdom, makes you happy rather than going to Jerusalem to worship, and then that is fine. Go ahead and follow your own heart. After all, as long as you do not hurt anyone and just be nice to, to other people, then God will understand because God is so gracious. And that's what they say. God is so loving and He even has a wonderful plan for you regardless of who you are and regardless of what you do. Ephraim encouraged their sins. As God says to the prophet Jeremiah again, in Jeremiah 5.31, it says here in Jeremiah 5.31, the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule at their, direc at their direction, and then look at this, my people love to have it so. Jeremiah says the people will to be deceived by this by these false prophets, and so they were. They loved what the prophets were saying to them, and, they, and so they fell into, their, into these false prophets, into their snares, into their traps. But God calls their ministry as insanity. To God, it is foolish. They stand up there to preach, and they say they have a word from me, but they never heard from me. Again, in Micah chapter 2, we read of just the sort of prophet that people would listen to. 
Micah chapter 2 verse 11. And I like to read the New Living Translation. Maganda po pakasulat niya. Suppose a prophet full of lies would say to you, I'll preach to you the joys of wine and alcohol. Paborito ito ng mga alcoholic, no? The joys of wine and alcohol. And look at the, the next thing. That's just the kind of prophet you would like. Ito rin gusto nila ng mga prophets na nagsasabi. Brothers and sisters, are not these descriptions of false prophets also so familiar with us today? Are we so blind and deaf so as not to see and hear that there are such prophets or preachers around today and some are even within the leadership churches? Even speaking over the radios, over the television programs, telling people what they want to hear? The Apostle Paul warned the young Timothy about this. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4 to 5, ito rin po yung warning ni Paul kay Timothy with regards to this kind of time. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine or sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths that a time will come when men and women, women would not listen to the sound teaching of the word of God but gather themselves preachers who would tickle their ears and massage their egos such happened in the days of Micah. It happened in the days of Jeremiah and Hosea. It happened in the days of Paul. And such is still happening today. People have not learned. People have refused to hear God's warnings. People to this day look for a preacher who will speak only what will not hurt them. Speak only what will make them feel good on a Sunday. Preachers who will embrace them even as they continue to sin and live lives displeasing to God. Another description of Israel's sin can be found in verse 4. Hosea chapter 9 verse 4. Let's start with the second part of Verse 3. And they shall eat unclean food in Assyria. They shall not pour, pour drink offerings of wine to the Lord, and their sacrifices shall not please Him. It shall be like mourner's bread to them. All who eat of it shall be defiled, for their bread shall be for their hunger only. It shall not come to the house of the Lord. Hosea's point is that even if God's people would be able to offer sacrifices while in captivity, this would not be acceptable for many reasons. First of all, they were covenant breakers who had defiled themselves with harlotry, harlotries associated with pagan worship practices. Secondly, because living in exile, they would not have the temple in which to worship. Lastly, their sacrifices would have been unacceptable because the lives that they live were defiled lives in captivity, making any sacrifice they could make polluted, just like mourner's bread. Hence, they would be refused by God. Yet, these people continue to give these defiled offerings and sacrifices to God. And worse, they come along with their offerings and rituals, making similar sacrifices to the other gods that they worship. These are the sins of Israel described. And you may ask, so what's the big deal? So they neglected their Bible? So they combined the practices of other religion to theirs? So they made some changes in their religious practices, in their sacrifices? So they created their own festivals. So they followed after false prophets and preachers. So they committed some sins. After all, how worldly and common could these sins be? And if God does anything, maybe the most that he would do would just be a sermon, a quick rebuke, or just a slap on the wrist. It is not as if they have committed some gross sins like rape, massacre or genocide 
It is not as if Israel was making some so-called biological weapon of mass destruction, as we have been hearing now in the news. It is not that the king of Israel has become like the ISIS, threatening people with terrorism, nor have they become suicide bombers or racists or big-time sinners. Their religion was only a little way off. Yun lang kasalanan, so-called nila. But brethren, in their sins, they rejected the truth, the gospel of the living God. Now let us consider what God thought of it. Let us go to the second part of our study today, and that is the terrible justice of God declared. The terrible justice of God declared. Hosea chapter 9, verse 7. The days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel shall know it. The prophet Joel also has this to say, although it may pertain to the revelation, but here the, the prophet Joel says there, this. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Hosea 9 is such a trumpet blast. It is a blast from God's holy mountain. It is a call for the people of the land to tremble. It is the acknowledgement that the day of the Lord is at hand. It is coming. The day of darkness is coming. That is to say, though God has been long-suffering for generation after their generation, the cup of his wrath is now full. What has been threatened and what has your, for, uh, were your fathers and your grandfathers and your great-grandfathers heard the prophets say, one day if you do not repent, one day if you do not turn, that is what God will do to you. That day has come and you're going to see it and your children are going to see it. Here, God describes the horror of judgment in three main ways. He describes it politically, He describes it economically, and He describes it domestically. That is to say, now, that, is to say, now that He has come to judge your sin, He's going to affect your freedom, He's going to touch your riches, and more tragically, God is going to touch your children. And here, are, and here are God's three main ways of judgment upon his sinning people. Political. Verse 3. Chapter 9, verse 3. They shall not remain in the land of the Lord, but Ephraim shall return to God, and they shall eat unclean food in Assyria. They're going to return to Egypt. This is a figure of speech. Egypt is a place known for bondage. That is where these people had come from. It was a place of misery from which they had been delivered. He was not saying that they were literally walking back to Egypt, but what God was saying is, you're going to experience what your forefathers have experienced. They were there in bondage for 400 years. And you look back on that with misery and bitterness, and that's going to happen to you now. It is as though a prophet has came to Israel right after World War II and said to them that the Nazi party shall rise, rise again and has come to a full strength once more to bring you to the same evil it did to the Jews in the past. That judgment will be so terrifying for those who had gone through the cruelty of this army. For God's people going back to Egypt was extremely fight frightening. 
that God is saying your worst of nightmare is going to happen to you. Your national identity that was marked out by a mighty deliverance from slavery will now be reversed. And what could be worse than having them go through all that suffering and pain and punishment again while it was still all fresh in their memories? In verse 17, it says there, My God will reject them because they have not listened to Him. They shall be wanderers among the nations. The people would experience the consequences of their lifestyle cho choices just as Gomer had. Like Cain, Cain's uh, Genesis, the people are doomed to wander among the nations. What a dreadful situation they will find themselves in. The delight to have once known the blessings of the promised land, but because of apostasy and unfaithfulness, they are now sentenced to wander homeless and aimlessly in this world. But now, and closely related to that, is God's economic judgment upon them. Hosea chapter 9, verse 2, the economic judgment upon them. Dressing floor and wine vat shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail them. And because God has forsaken them, the blessings that the harvest symbolized would soon come to an end. And verse 6, say a 9 verse 6, okay, we read, For behold, they are going away from destruction, but Egypt shall gather them, Memphis shall bury them, nettles shall possess their precious things of silver, thorns, shall be in their tents. Hosea describes an additional problem that will beset God's sinning people. Those who escape the invading army by fleeing to Egypt for safety will find little or no relief there. Instead, they will live hard, very poor lives and die and be buried at Memphis, which was the scene of the largest cemetery in Egypt. As befalls those who flee from God, they will not be able to flee from His judgment, but instead fall into more certain destruction. The pleasant places for their silver, the fine houses or villas which they had purchased by their money, being now neglected and uninhabited, are covered with nettles, and even in their tabernacles, thorn, thorns and weeds of different kinds grow. These are the fullest mark of utter desolation. It's like a ghost town in the places that they have left. God is saying, all your pretty things, your cherished possessions where you have found delight will be gone. They shall be left there empty. No one shall be there to cut the thorns and the nettles. No one is going to be there to kill the weeds. No one is going to be there to keep the animals out of your place. And to put it in modern terms, God's word is saying, the termites will eat your big, beautiful gated houses, thorn bushes will cover your SUVs, and weeds will overrun your time deposits and investments in the bank, your businesses and the treasures where you have put your hearts in. And that's what is going to happen to you. You're going to be ruined politically, you're going to be exiled. And because you're going to be exiled, all your riches will be taken away. And this is what literally happened. The country was so desolated and depopulated that the wild beasts took over the whole land. And the desolation was so terrible that nahirapan pa yung hari ng Assyria to reclaim it nung naiwanan ng mga Israelita. And the account of that is in 2 Kings chapter 17. Now let's go to the third, God's judgment upon them domestically. God's judgment upon them domestically. And that's in verse 11. Ephraim's glory shall fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Some of us here may say, I could stand the loss of my liberty or I could live without my possessions. Those judgment I might be able to bear. But now, hear this. God says, the judgment is going to fall particularly with regards to your family, 
especially involving your children. God says, I will withhold from you the gift of future children, and I will take from you the ones that you now have. Fruitfulness and consequent strength had been God's special promise to Ephraim. Yung ang pangalan ni Ephraim contained in itself the promise of his future fruitfulness. And we remember yung blessing ni Jacob na binigay niya kay Ephraim instead to Manasseh. And on this blessing, Ephraim has presumed, had presumed and had made it to feed his pride. So now God in his justice and mercy would withdraw it from him. Having children is one of the great blessings live, living in the Old Testament times. A great blessing any Jewish man will have that their wives will, will, will be like a fruitful vine and the children shall all be on their table. But God says, this is not for them anymore. I'm going to dry up their womb. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. And God continues in the declaration of his judgment. In verse 12, he says, Even if they bring up children, I will bereave them till none is left. Woe to them when I depart from them. God had threatened to deprive them of children in every stage, before, during, and after birth. But beyond the loss of the children whom they hoped, hoped or longed for, beyond the loss of their present might and all their hope to come, there is a further undefined, unlimited evil. Woe to them also when God should withdraw not his care and providence only, but himself also from them. They had departed and turned away from God, and it, had been, and it has been their characteristic. But now God himself would reject them as they rejected him, and he would depart from them. And this was the last step in the scale of misery. Verse 13 says, Ephraim, as I have seen, was like a young palm planted in a meadow, but Ephraim must lead his children out to slaughter. But to understand, I like the NASB translation when it says, Ephraim, as I have seen, is planted in a pleasant meadow like Tyre. It was compared to a town like Tyre, but Ephraim will bring out his children for slaughter. The comment here regarding Tyre compares the favorable situation of the pagan city to the favorable situation of Ephraim in Canaan. That is, they have been established, prosperous, and secured. But neither their material prosperity nor their strategic military position could avert the avenging stroke of the wrath of God when it was time for the judgment to fall. They had started out well and in, direct, and in the right direction and in the right relationship with God, but over time, they drifted away from God and from the things of God. What started out with such great hope and potential ends in death and despair. That is terrifying. God will cast them away because they did not obey Him. What happened to Israel? What happened to their children? What happened to the sons of this family or that family? It is as if Israel had brought them out to the, to the murder, had brought them out to the murderers. That is to say that the sins they executed have been sins against their own children. Their sin brought them into the place of danger. They put their children and their families under the wrath of God with no protection at all. They brought them out to a place where they were no longer protected. Raiding armies would come in and rip off their pregnant women. They would destroy their sons and daughters. They were driven from God's house. They were made wanderers among their nations. They've been exposing these children to their sins and, there's, and their children just grew up with their sins. Hosea verse 14 says, give them, O Lord, what will you give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breast. Here the prophet, seeing the evils that were likely to fall upon his countrymen, begins to make intercession for them. But when he had formed the first part of his petition, when he said, give them, O Lord, 
Hosea bows to the will of God and the judgment of God upon the people of Israel. When an, what an awful prayer for Hosea to have to pray for the people he is called to bring God's word to. He prays that they might be fruitless. And that may seem harsh, a harsh thing for him to pray. But let us get a right perspective on it. Because Hosea knew God and knew of his holiness, Hosea could not bring himself to pray that God would just utterly destroy them in his judgment. His prayer was then actually a merciful prayer that he prays for this unfaithful people. No doubt, all the time thinking of Gomer and her unfaithfulness and his love for her, Hosea tempers his prayer and asks God for a lesser judgment when he prays this. You know, sometimes as a pastor or as a loving parent or as a loving spouse or as a loving brother, you pray such prayers for people. Lord, make their ways fruitless till they come to their senses and repent and turn to you. Do you think it is just possible that the father in the parable that the prodigal son prayed such a prayer for his unfaithful and wayward son? Do you think you could pray such a prayer for an unfaithful and wayward child, a spouse, a brother undergoing church discipline? Could you pray that God would make all their ways fruitless and restless till they repented of their sins and returned to God? It is a prayer of mercy, just like the prayer of Hosea. Verse 15 says, Every evil of theirs is in Gilgal. There I began to hate them. Because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels. Gilgal, having been the scene of so many of God's mercies, had been on that very ground chosen as a popular scene for idol worship. They had promised blessing and potential, but it ended in rebellion and rejection. The way Israel behaved at Gilgal is how they are behaving now. Now I want you to listen carefully to these words because they are words we do not normally hear of God or associate with God. Again, we read verse 15. There I began to hate them. That God is saying that. God hated them. Those are strong words, but they are the only words that God has and that Hosea can use to make the people realize the extent of their unfaithfulness and sin and how much God detests sin. God hates sin and all those who engage in sinful practices. My brothers and sisters, this is how seriously God takes sin. I realize sometimes somebody might say who sits under this ministry, why do our elders make a big deal about these things? Why do our elders say we need to be like this, we need to be like that? Why do we make a big deal about the doctrine of the Lordship salvation, about the doctrine, about the gospel? of Jesus Christ? Why do we spend hours in this pulpit warning against those who would turn the grace of God into license? Why do we mourn about the state of the land, particularly the state of the things in the churches? Why do we do that? Brethren, we do this because God takes these things seriously. God takes his word, God takes his worship with deadly earnestness. He takes it so seriously that a nation that disobeys is wiped out, 
They are gone entirely. The northern kingdom does not come back. They become assimilated into the Gentiles. How seriously does God take sin? Brethren, we can go back into the history of the world and we can go to a place nation after nation and we can go to Israel and we can tour the destroyed temple. We can go to church history and we can consider the ruin of congregation after congregation and the destruction of the denominations. But in the moments that remain for us this morning, I want to take you into two places. I want to take you into a place where we will all leave this place mercifully understanding how seriously God takes our sin. Do you want to know how seriously God takes sin? I want to take you to one place. And that place is called hell, infierno. You see, if you are not convinced of the terrors of sin, and if you are not convinced of the justice of God, then hell will seem to be an extreme injustice. It is no surprise that in many of today's churches, it can no longer stomach the doctrine of hell, which the Bible describes as a place of of inconsolable grief and unremitting torment. They can put a Hitler there, or an Obama bin Laden there, or the ISIS, the dictators who defrauded and massacred their countrymen. We can all imagine the murderers, the rapists, the drug pushers, the corrupt politicians, and the like in hell. But my good, decent, even religious neighbors spending all eternity in a place the Bible calls a lake of fire and never ever getting out? My parents, my brothers, my sisters, our friends, our neighbors, co-workers whom we have lunch with and eat with and be merry with, friends whom we love and share gifts with are going to hell forever under the wrath of God, never ever getting out. These loving, good-natured people experiencing eternal judgment, punishment. You see, if you're never convinced of the horror of sin and the holiness of God, again, we will not stomach the doctrine of eternal punishment. People say that is extreme. That is too much. Some say God must allow either all should come in or if God, and he, a God must deal with the wicked, then let it be that he will just sub them out. Let it be that God will just annihilate them, just letting their souls rest in peace something which people are actually teaching, or just put their souls in a place temporarily, like a purgatory, to purge it, but not to a permanent place of torment like hell. Again, to say such a thing is to say that we do not understand the nature of sin and the holiness of God and the justice of God. If it would be profitable, if we could go back like in a time machine and to see the bank overrun by nettles and to see the silver covered and to see the rubble of the temple and to go to Jerusalem as it was overrun during 70 AD by the army of Titus and to see the wrath of God came out or to visit the flood during Noah's time. We can go to many places and to go there to meditate upon hell. And it will show to us the seriousness of sin and the justice of God. But there is another place. And this is God's prescription for his judgment. 
And that place is a hill. Isang bundok. It is a hill where a man stretched out on a cross and died for us who sinned. And the man cries out and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? After he gave his last breath, the skies blackened and the earth rumbles and the rocks are torn. How seriously does God take sin? He takes sin so seriously that He sends His beloved Son into the world to become a baby and to live under the law. He takes sin so seriously that the God of glory has been blasphemed to His ears, has been beaten, has been mocked, ridiculed, and crucified under the wrath of God. That is how seriously God takes sin. That is how seriously God takes on His justice. Friends, we better take these things seriously because the realities of sin, whether you believe it or not, has to, do, has to be dealt with in either one of these two places that I described. It may well be that God is going to send a temporal judgment upon our land. People may still get their way and some people may do what they want to do. We may see calamities in our cities. We may see our city in rubble. Maybe one morning we may wake up and this city might be gone and that is not impossible. But my friends, we have to pay for our sins. Our nation will have to pay for our sins and the churches will have to pay for their sins. And we are going to find that they have to be paid for in one of those places only. It will have to be paid for eternity in hell or it will be paid for and satisfied on the cross of Jesus on that hill. Friends, Listen to God in Hosea this morning. Listen to the warning that if you continue to walk after other gods and live a life which is unfaithful and immoral, then this morning God hates your sin and He will depart from you. Hear that warning today. Hear that warning now. Hear God's footsteps of judgment coming into your life today and heed the call to repent. You might think this morning, well, he's not speaking to me and this passage does not really apply to me. But let me ask you now, where is your heart? What is the love of your life? What consumes most of your time and thoughts? What it takes most of your finances? To what do you give most of your time? How much time this past week did you spend reading your Bible or praying or in fellowship with other people? You see, we all have plenty of other gods in our lives because anything that comes before God in our lives is our God, our idol. For some here this morning, you are just starting down the road of unfaithfulness and immorality. You have started to walk away from God. Heed the warning of Hosea. And if you continue to walk away, it will surely end in desolation and despair for you. So stop right now and turn back. Some of you in this hall this morning need to take your sin seriously. That is the number one thing that keeps men and women from the cross. The most often reason that keeps young people from the cross. You do not view your sin as serious as God does. See the ruined nations. Hear the souls of the damned in hell. Hear the cry of the Son of God on the cross and tell me if God does not take sin seriously. May God help us to hear the trumpet blast 
today. Brothers and sisters, Hosea is a timely warning to us all, and this morning I know it has been heavy. But we need to hear of God's judgment of sin because sometimes in knowing and ever overemphasizing His love, we forget from what He has rescued us from. Let us pray. But before we do that, let's pause for a while and really examine ourselves. Tingnan po natin ating mga sarili. Tingnan po natin saan po tayo nagkasala. And for those who have not yet surrendered their lives to God, who have not made Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, let really be this, let this be a warning to you. Draw to God and then said, Come to me. Cry out to Him while He is still near. Draw to Him. A broken spirit and a contrite heart, he said, he will not despise. As I have mentioned earlier, our congregational prayer will be after the message. And let our prayer concern be for the salvation of our loved ones, family members, close friends and colleagues whom we are constantly exposed or been with. We believe and often quote that word of God which says, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Yet so often we do not address their spiritual condition but shows more concern for their material and their emotional needs only. And at times we turn a blind eye to their sins. And because of our attitude of see no evil, hear no evil, and speak no evil, we become an accomplice to their deaths. And maybe because these acquaintances of ours are good-natured, pleasing to be with, and even have attitudes better than some professing Christians, nakakaligtaan na natin ang kanilang tunay na spiritual condition. But let us not forget God's word in Second Thessalonians 1, that God inflicts vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Let this message this morning wakes us up once again and help us as believers not to be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Salamat ka po sa mga salita na yun that we can say we stand forgiven at the cross. Oh God, in your mercy, you have spoken to us your warnings today. We do not know when your deadline is. It may be right after we walk out of this building. It may be tonight. It may be tomorrow. But in the preaching of your word today, in the circumstances we see around us, in the changes that we see in our land, and in the utter disregard for sin that we see everywhere, we know that the end is sure to come. Father, we pray that we will remember to take your word seriously. We ask that we would learn our lessons and we see sin as sin and turn away from it and turn back to your cross and to your sacrifice. Our Father, do spare us and our children as well. May it be that none of us will so sin that we hand over our children to the murderers, that we hand them over to the murderers of the world, murderers of their souls, and to the murderers of their bodies. Help us to love them. We beg for grace for our loved ones, 
for our family and friends. May there be glory in the birth and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, through our repentance and reconciliation with you. And may we see that there is a prescription for our sick and evil ways, a way back to you, back to the covenant you have promised for us. And may this be the day of salvation for many here. May there be a serious dwelling and meditation upon your word, upon the message so clearly shouted in Hosea. And may there be rejoicing in heaven. And may the trumpets blast, no longer to warn, but to celebrate for the souls that march back to your kingdom, back to eternal joy with you. And this is our prayer, Lord, to your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. O oh, dear Father in heaven, we come before you again to thank you for all that you do for us. For we know that everything we are and everything we have is because of you and your love for us. Now, Father, we pray that each of us will carefully look within his or her own mind and heart and joyfully return to your portion of that which you have generously provided to us. Once again, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and let the people of God say, Amen.